Namaste, welcome to this episode of uh, Clear Cut with Jaisai Deepak. Uh, we've organized this uh, conversation today uh, in the midst of the Corona lockdown uh, because the occasion calls for it. Uh, as most of the viewers would know, um, Hindu society has had a remarkable, a historic moment uh, in the, its modern political history with the judgment in the Padmanabh Swami temple case. Um, why I call it historic will become clear uh, in the course of the conversation I'm having with Sai Deepak. Um, but just to give you a little bit of uh, uh, background of the same, we've been campaigning for years now on freeing temples from government control. And what this judgment has done, in my opinion, is to pave the way for uh, freeing the institution of the temple, which is all across the country, all temples, uh, to be freed from government control, this judgment, in my opinion, would count as a landmark event. To discuss the same, uh, we have none other than Sai Deepak himself. Uh, welcome to another episode. Thank you. Um, can we start with explaining to the viewers what the genesis of the case really is? I think anybody who is from Delhi will be able to relate to this uh, case really well because it all started with the eviction proceeding of a tenant. So, a practicing advocate who was a tenant on a premises owned by the temple was asked to vacate the premises in 2009 by the then executive officer and the tenant refused to and challenged the authority of the executive officer on the ground that his own appointment as executive officer was illegal because the person who appointed him as the executive officer lacked the authority to do so under law. So, in response to an eviction proceeding, the gentleman files a writ petition before the, the Kerala High Court in 2009 uh, on the grounds that the royal family does not fall within the definition of ruler for the purposes of the Travancore Cochin Hindu Religious Institutions Act of uh, 1950, which effectively governs temples in Kerala. Because uh, according to him, post the 26th amendment of the constitution in 1971, when royal titles and other, uh, let's say, privileges were abolished, the concept of a ruler effectively became infructuous or redundant. And therefore, any power or privilege enjoyed by the Travancore royal family with respect to the Padmanabha Swami temple came to an end, according to him, either in 1971 or at the very least, after the death of the signatory to the original covenant between the Travancore princely state and the Indian Union, who passed away in 1991, which is uh, the legendary uh, king of the Travancore princely state, uh, Chitra Tirunal Balarama Varma, who was known as the walking Vishnu uh, Dasa, so to speak, or Padmanabha Dasa, so to speak, because of his saintly nature. And owing to the fact that practically every institution of public importance in Tirunanthapuram was built by him and under him. So this is effectively how the proceedings started. And uh, a couple of suits were also filed uh, before the district courts or local courts of Tirunathapuram, uh, challenging the authority of the family over the temple, in addition to basically saying or alleging that perhaps there is some kind of mismanagement. Now, for all practical purposes, across the country, we have seen such, uh, let's say, frivolous alleg allegations being hurled against uh, traditional management structures of the temple. And half the time, most of these people are propped. So, there was already a pending writ petition filed in 2009 by the tenant and these suits were filed in various courts in Thiruvananthapuram by employees and others. So, the then uh, ruler of the family or the head of the family, Sri Marthanda Varma, approaches the high court in 2010 in a writ petition saying, all these suits, the civil suits in various courts must be transferred to the high court because ultimately the central question in all these proceedings was, whether they continue to have any authority over the temple and whether the 26th amendment made a difference to their relationship with the temple. So the writ petition filed by the tenant and the writ petition filed by the ruler, both of them are tagged together and then it results in a judgment of the Kerala High Court, which comes out on the 31st of January 2011, in which the Kerala High Court basically says that any privilege enjoyed or any position enjoyed by the ruler of Travancore who originally signed the covenant in May 1949 
uh, on behalf of the princely states of Travancore and Cochin on the one hand and the Indian Union on the other, ended with his demise in 1991. And in any case, post the abolition of Privy Persis in 1971, thanks to the 26th Amendment, there is no concept of a ruler. And since everywhere in the act with respect to the Padmanabha Swami temple, the word ruler has been used and the word ruler has become useless. Therefore, none of his successors would have any rights with respect to the temple. That was basically the position. So the simple question was this, whether the use of the word ruler in the act, in the Travancore Cochin Hindu Religious Institutions Act of 1950, was it with reference to an individual or was it with reference to an office? Therefore, if it's an individual, then it ends with the signatory of the covenant of 1949. But if it's re with reference to an office, then the successors get rights as well. So that's the basic question. So the Kerala High Court rules that it was, uh, it ended with the life of the previous ruler, which is in 1991. And not just that, the Kerala High Court passes detailed directions facilitating the takeover of the temple, its assets and management by the state government of Kerala through ostensibly a trust which is created by the state government of Kerala. And it also directed opening of all the vaults of the temple which were held to be sacred and never opened, at least some of the vaults. And for every article in each of the vaults to be inventorized and put out for public display in a museum on a payment basis so that people, tourists and the general public can visit the temple to look at that on the payment of a fee. So effectively, what those articles which we effectively treat as articles of darshan had become articles of pradarshan. That is the consequence of the Kerala High Court judgment. It is against that judgment that the royal family approached the Supreme Court in 2011. And from what I understand, because I was not party to the proceedings in 2011, stay was granted by the Supreme Court on day one. And pending the disposal of the entire matter, the court put in place certain committees which would administer and govern this particular temple in the interregnum, so to speak. And that is the proceeding which has ultimately resulted in the judgment of 13th of July 2020 where the court has finally come to the conclusion that the High Court's judgment was patently erroneous, incorrect, and certainly uh, flew in the face of the history of the covenant, the spirit behind the protection given to this particular family, especially in the uh, Travancore Cochin Act of 1950. So that's basically the sum and substance of the legal outcome. Right. So this is a very interesting point because what it points at is that we have now uh, started looking at temples as uh, some sort of museum or a place of picnic or tourism, right? Um, and that's been true for whether it is Kedarnath or whether it is pa Padmanabha Swami temple. Right. Uh, you know, it has a very negative uh, thing for the future of uh, the institution as such, right? Correct, it does. See, uh, the one thing that I wanted to ask myself was, assume for a moment if I were not a practicing Hindu, how would I view at this particular direction of the Kerala High Court? To me, as someone who believes in the concept of sanctity of religious spaces to some extent, significant extent in fact, uh, a direction of a secular institution which effectively strips a religious institution of its sanctity and all of that is sanctified in a judicial order and the entire religious institution is assigned and handed over to a so-called secular institution or a secular body is unimaginable even as, let's say, a practitioner of constitutional law, at the very least a believer of constitutional law. You don't need to be a person who believes either in religion or in Hinduism to arrive at this basic reasonable conclusion that on the face of it, the directions of the Kerala High Court transgressed perhaps uh, all canons of uh, reasonableness, all canons of expectations of fairness with respect to treatment of fundamental freedoms of religious nature, both individual and institutional. Because this was not just a question of one family of the temple. Crores and crores of people across the world believe in Lord Padmanabha Swami and the temple is the object of worship and faith and respect and whatnot. So I certainly believe that this was an extremely disturbing consequence. Which is why when you look at what happened before the Kerala High Court and what the institution has gone through over the last at least in 2009, you're looking at 11 years now. The judgment of the Supreme Court is a welcome uh, relief. There is no doubting that at all. I mean, it's always easy to look at things from an idealistic perspective, but let us look at what is it that we were going through all these days, what the family was going through all these days, what the devotees were subjected to, 
and where we stand today. So, in fact, I wanted to ask you this very specifically. You know, you are a lawyer and a Hindu. And uh, is there a distinction when you approach your cases uh, between your legal training and, you know, how do you draw a distinction between the two sides of your uh, personality or, or your being? So, think of it as a mental divide between someone who is an entrepreneur at one end and who is also a lawyer at the other end. So the entrepreneur is anyone who decides the end goal and the lawyer helps him reach that particular goal. And then he asks himself whether the goal is fundamentally unreachable under law or what is it you must do either within the box or outside the box to reach that particular goal. Now the objectivity of the lawyer must come with respect to the viability of the path. But with respect to the destination, I think the other side takes over. So as far as I am concerned, I have certain beliefs. There is a decent chance that some may or may not agree with those beliefs. But as someone who I think is a fairly good student of law, I know what is, what is the legal feasibility of achieving some of those goals. And thus far, thanks to practice and through experience and application, I am able to show that it is possible to achieve these goals and fairly within the four corners of the law without having to stretch too much. So this is, um, you know, you've explained your approach when it comes to, uh, when you take up a case, how do you argue, how do you frame the entire problem. Right. Uh, if we look at this particular case, the judgment that we are speaking about, the Padmanabha Swami judgment, as a Hindu, not as Saidipak the lawyer, as a Hindu, how do you see it? And I don't know if it's even a reasonable question to us, but I was really curious to know. So, in fact, uh, there is a third side to it, which is, uh, do I approach it from an activist perspective? I frankly don't do so. That's something that's very, very important. And I don't have a problem with the concept of activism. I don't even have a problem with a lawyer who perhaps is, is also an activist, but I don't want to be one. So I try and keep this entire issue as objective as possible in terms of assessing the outcome itself, because it's important to know whether you're exaggerating a certain achievement and are you blind to some of the pitfalls in that particular achievement and if at all it's an achievement in the first place. So hoping that I'm striking a balance between my identity as a practicing Hindu and my training as a lawyer and as an individual, as, as let's say just a Sai Deepak, my question to myself is, one is the judgment the most ideal of outcomes. Any practicing lawyer will tell you there's no such thing as an ideal outcome in a judicial proceeding. It's like a military, uh, uh, let's say, a st uh, let's say an operation. Nothing ever goes according to plan, okay? But you try and factor in and account for as many exigencies and contingencies as possible, and then you have alternative options. But I must say, for a welcome change, as a Hindu, this is one of the few verdicts which I would certainly be proud of as a Hindu. Because what is the alternative? What could have gone wrong? The court could have completely upheld the judgment of the Kerala High Court. What would we do then? We go back in a review again? So it's Sabarimala 2.0? Right. That is yeah. what would have happened? Right? True, true. So when you look at what is the other possibility, which is very, very real, and which is in the realm of plausibility, not just possibility, it is very clear that you have managed to achieve one of the perhaps more difficult outcomes coming from the community you come from. Right? And imagine in modern, secular, republican, whatever India, the right of a royal family with respect to a temple based and rooted in Hindu tradition has been accepted hmm. in 2020. That's big deal. So given the Mahal and the atmosphere that we live in, <laughs> I would ask myself, let us be a bit realistic and learn to celebrate one of the few achievements that we get but not lose sight of what is it that it could portend in terms of drawbacks as well. I'm more than happy to look at all of those things. But I think this community deserves hope. Mm. And this judgment is a shot in the arm of the community to say it is not futile to put faith in the legal process. Mm. It may be slow, it may take time, but you have no other option but to persevere unless and until you have better options on the table, which you don't at this point of time. Indeed, indeed. That's what it exactly does, that it places the hope of the Hindu community, it strengthens the, the, the trust of the Hindu community in the legal institution. Uh, so coming to the case, uh, who were the parties involved 
know who were you representing right um how did the entire thing go about in the court it's interesting that you asked me this question because of the last few days multiple dramatists person a have been uh, asking me this question at the same time uh, i think a few armchair geniuses even ended up asking me if i was ever a party to the case or if i was ever a participant in the proceeding and uh, I didn't want to respond to that. Fortunately, a few of the people responded to them on my behalf. I don't know why, but I'm grateful to them. So here's the thing. As I said earlier, the royal family, along with the temple trust. So royal family has the ruler as the head of the family plus other members. They were all individual parties to the case. So the royal family's head was represented by one council, and I think it's important to name them. Sri Krishna Venu Gopal, senior advocate, represented the royal family's head, the king. um uh, along with mr sham mohan uh, who is a fantastic lawyer and a good friend uh senior advocate shri arvind p datar represented the temple trust uh other members of the royal family were represented by advocate mk s min we entered the proceedings on behalf of people for dharma uh and uh, the chief tantri of the temple and the temple protection movement which is effectively a movement started by mv saundar rajan the former chief priest of the chilkur balaji temple in hyderabad we represented all of them as interveners not parties exactly but as interveners but who was proceeding sorry whose contribution was accepted by the court and has been properly recorded we effectively entered appearance on behalf of these entities in 2017 18 and 19 respectively okay. so by the time the matter had picked up steam and was uh, ripe for final arguments from january 2019 all these three parties had already uh, lined up before the court effectively for all practical purposes and um, uh, on the opposite side of course you had the state government of kerala and then you had the original tenant who continued to fight the battle uh, until the supreme court and there is one party that most people are actually not aware of because for some reason nobody wants to talk about it the union of india has been participating in these proceedings at least it has been represented in these proceedings and uh, from orders dated 20th of march 2017 until the conclusion of oral submissions on the 10th of april 2019 there was constant representation on behalf of the union of india during these proceedings but of course nobody submitted anything on behalf of the union of india so for all practical purposes the central government was a silent spectator to the proceedings despite being a participant so they had nothing to say uh, that seems like it since they have not said anything either they have had nothing to say or they don't wish to say anything these are the only two consequences i i can't see it any other way other than these people to the best of my knowledge nobody else was present in court no other party was party to the proceedings so this is to my knowledge i'm happy to be corrected i have been participating in these proceedings since 2017 i haven't seen anybody else and of course there was representation from this is important the yogatil potimar uh, this is effectively um the committee of uh seven to eight brahmins who also form part of the traditional management structure and are stakeholders of the temple so you have the chief tantri then you have the king and you have the yogatil potimar so it's called ettara yogam which effectively means eight and a half votes the king has half a vote and everybody else has one one vote each okay so all of these people were present none else was present in the proceedings to the best of my knowledge so you have given us a sense of uh, your feeling about the judgment as a uh, layman uh now can we make it a slightly more technical and legal what are the positives that we've got from the judgment legally speaking right so looking at it purely as a lawyer i would say there are three broad outcomes that we should look at one the entire relationship between the royal family and the temple is based on a specific instrument a document what is the document it is the covenant signed between the rulers of the princely states of travancore and cochin the merged state after the uh, after the independence of course on the one hand and the indian union on the other the indian union was represented by mr vp menon the right hand man of sardar vallabhai patel who worked with him for integration of states who was doing the negotiations with all the princely states the rulers on this side had rulers of the travancore state as well as the cochin state so who was the ruler for the travancore state at that stage chitratirunal balarama verma who passed away in 1991 ultimately so he was the signatory okay now what was this covenant all about so once you sign the instrument of accession saying i wish to be a part of bharat 
you enter into a, a couple of more agreements to protect a couple of your interests and your rights. Now that is the document which we are referring to, which is the covenant. Now that document was not entered into separately by Travancore and Cochin. A single document was entered into on behalf of both the princely states because by then both the states had merged to become the Travancore Cochin state. Okay. Now the central feature of this document which is relevant to the case is a provision called Article 8. Article 8 is what captures the covenant or the let's say the promise made by the Indian Union to the ruler of the Travancore family that their rights and their control over the management of the Padmanabha Swami temple shall not be interfered with not just in his lifetime but also to his successors. The rest of the temples form part of the Travancore Deva Swam board, which is all the temples in Travancore and Cochin. But this particular temple falls under the exclusive domain of the ruler of Travancore. Just as you have a separate uh, princely uh, state or let's say a royal family taking care of Gurvayur and another royal family taking care of the Tripunatra temple, I think in Cochin. Okay, so these three major temples of Kerala have special relationships with different families. And this family has a special relationship with the Padmanabha Swami temple. That's what the covenant recognizes. So this happens, I think, in May 1949. They signed this particular document. In 1950, the HRC legislation of Kerala, which is the Travancore Cochin Hindu Religious Institutions Act of 1950, comes about. And there is a specific chapter of this particular act, which is chapter 3, sections 18 to 23. The chapter itself is called Sri Padmanabha Swami temple. Okay. So there is a chapter dedicated to this institution and this chapter effectively captures all the obligations which were recorded as part of the covenant. Why? You have a state legislation. Now that state legislation must also capture the obligations which was entered into in a treaty of sorts, in a covenant of sorts. So that is the role performed by this particular chapter. So under the, uh, let's say, the structure, the Raja, so to speak, has the right and the power to appoint a three-member committee and there is an executive officer as well who is appointed by the Raja. All of them aid the Raja in the discharge of his functions towards the administration of the temple. That is the structure as it exists in the Act and there has been no amendment to that particular portion of the Act either after 1950 and till date it remains as is where is. Multiple amendments have been undertaken to the act overall, but this particular chapter remains unchanged even after the abolition of the Privy Purses in 1971, even after the death of the first ruler or let's say the covenant ruler in 1991, nothing has changed as far as this chapter is concerned. Okay, so the state government which says that they have lost rights undertakes amendments with respect to the rest of the act but never touches this particular chapter, meaning thereby they understand that this is protected by the covenant. Okay, that's the structure under the act. Now, what has happened today is that the Supreme Court recognizes that this entire act or let's say this chapter of the act, if that is Ganga, the Gangotri is the covenant. And the relationship which is recognized in the covenant is a special relationship where the Travancore family is like a Sevayat, which is the earthly custodian and representative of the deity. Okay, that is the relationship between them. And that particular relationship is not the product of a British title. Hmm. It's not like a Rai Bahadur, Nawab, nothing of that sort. So, abolition of Privy Purses in 1971 can take away all of the titles, but not this relationship which has pre-existed them, even before the concept of British came about for all practical purposes. Okay. So, therefore the court says, this particular relationship stands unaffected by the abolition of Privy Purses in 1971. And that the right that was given under Article 8 was not limited to the sign signing uh, ruler, so to speak, or that particular ruler who was alive at that particular point of time, but also his successors. That is the primary finding. Why is this important? Every other royal family which has its own temple would have entered into a covenant of similar nature where its rights with respect to its institution would have been protected. Okay, But unfortunately, over a point of time, the Indian state and its representatives have managed to go back on their obligations with respect to this, right? The abolition of the Privy Purses itself was going back on what was promised, right? Now, therefore, what is the long-term application of this particular judgment? Similarly placed temples and similarly placed royal families can agitate in a similar manner for a similar outcome. That's point number one. And there are any number of temples across the country 
which are similarly placed, almost similarly placed. You can't call them identical. Mysore, Ekling Jain, Mewad, and a lot of other places. So that's one. What happens to the current administrative structure, which seems to be the primary uh, point of discussion everywhere? There were three sets of proposals broadly that were placed before the court. One proposal went from the royal family itself by the ruler of the royal from the rule of the royal family. One proposal came from the state government, and one proposal went from us, the interveners. The court has, for all practical purposes, accepted the proposal of the ruler in entirety almost, except with one or two changes. What is the structure that has been proposed? I said there is an existing advisory committee. Now you have two committees. The advisory committee, which is the committee recognized under the Act, has three people as usual. In addition to that, there is an administrative committee, which has five people. Now who are the three people? Who are the five people? Where is this interference coming from? Under the advisory committee, you effectively have a retired judge of the High Court nominated by the Chief Justice of the Kerala High Court who shall be a member of that particular committee, Okay, the advisory committee. Then you have someone who is nominated by the ruler. And the third person is a reputed chartered accountant who is nominated by the uh, retired judge but in consultation with the ruler. So this is the three member committee. Then you have the administrative committee. The Raja had basically proposed that the first person shall be a retired IAS officer of the rank of the secretary okay, from the government of Kerala, which the court has replaced with the district judge. So that's one member. So district judge, followed by a nominee of the ruler, followed by a nominee of the Ministry of Culture, Union Ministry of Culture, followed by a nominee of the state government. And there is one more person, I think a reputed chartered accountant or something of that sort. There is one more person. So totally there are about five people. Now the fear that has been uh, floated in, uh, in, a, in a couple of circles is you have a state government nomi, uh, nominee, you have a central government nominee and you have a couple of retired judges sitting here and also presiding judges sitting here. This is effectively a backdoor to facilitate government entrenchment or establishment en uh, entrenchment uh, by recognizing the rights of the Raja on the one hand and still creating a backdoor entry on the other. People should read the act and that's why it helps to at least read the law. Trained lawyers we have been trained for some reason. <laughs> we may not be as great as legal correspondents, we may not be as intelligent as journalists, but we are at least intelligent as lawyers, so people should give us some credit for that. Okay. If you look at the Act, it clearly says that the administrative committee, which is now replacing the executive officer who was previously appointed by the Raja, shall be under the control and supervision of the ruler. That is what the provision says. So people have not read the provision, they're just shooting from their hips in the mm, dark. Mm, okay. Mm. Second, the advisory committee shall advise the Raja with respect to the discharge of his functions. So one committee is under the supervision and control, the other shall only advise. Mm. Now, let's apply our logic. If you have effectively recognized that Article 8 is valid and Article 8 speaks of his dominion over this particular temple, can it be the court's conclusion that I will uphold his rights on one hand like this and on the other hand I will dilute it by creating committees which can override and prevail over his, uh, let's say, supremacy, so to speak? Not possible. That's what logic says. I don't know what other forms of logic are possible. But the other thing is, the Act expressly states that under Section 18, that particular entity which performs the role of the executive officer, which is the administrative committee, shall be under the control and supervision of the ruler. And as far as Section 20 is concerned, the advisory committee shall only advise the discharge of the functions. So according to me, this is like a telescope. At the top is the ruler, then comes the advisory committee, then comes the administrative committee. Now, What is it that people are not telling you? In the judgment, the court goes on to say further that in matters of policy relating to the fundamental character of the temple, it shall be the ruler who has the final say. And what are those issues that the court actually identifies? Five specific issues. Any monthly expenditure, one-time expenditure over one crore, you have to take the permission of the ruler. Any expense item which is over 15 lakhs, you have to ask. Any expansion or renovation of the temple, you have to ask. The ruler, not just ask, you need his approval. That's what it says. I'll tell you the page, para number is 47, page number 100, take a look at Roman number 11, that's what it says. Three, what the court also says, that any aspect of the administration which changes the fundamental character of the temple insofar as religious sentiments are concerned, it will be the Raja who is the final authority. 
and with respect to all the vaults and treasures that people wanted to open, the discretion is left to the committees. But as I said, the committees are operating under the Raja. The Raja is bound by the tradition. I rest my case. Right, right. No, in fact, I mean, as you spell it out, uh, it just occurred to me that in the traditional scheme of things, the Raja was always advised by a group of ministers. Correct. And now that that institution has sort of... It's an eight-member committee. Think of it as an Ashtapradhan. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. So, how do you then, uh, you know, what do you make, make of the negativity that has... Uh, surrounded this issue ever since the judgment has come and you know a lot See, of people it's like a party which has constantly been in the opposition and doesn't know how to become a ruling party now right right we know some one party <laughs> like that so we have done dharnas we have burnt a couple of effigies we have gone to jail we have been arrested now that we come to treasury benches we still want to say the same thing okay I'm not saying certainly that everything is hunky dory I'm certainly still of the opinion that the court could have avoided populating this particular body with state representatives and that is where we had raised a couple of arguments. Unfortunately, the court said that those arguments were never raised before the High Court. I'll come to that later. The basic point is, uh, in fact, I'll quote you here, we must perhaps not master the art of pulling defeat from the intestines of victory. Okay, that is something that we must not do because I am asking myself this simple question. Draw heart from the fact that the other side is seething, the other side has lost and the other side is effectively saying everything that I've managed to get from the Kerala High Court in the first judgment, I've lost it effectively. Everything is gone. Right? right, right. So there is no question of touching the treasures of the temple because that's sacred property that's not supposed to be touched. The fundamental relationship between the family and the temple has been restored. And the control of the ruler over the administration of the temple for all practical purposes has been restored with adequate safeguards, right? Yeah. So where is the problem? The problem is in twofold. According to me, these are, let's call it footnotes for all practical purposes. The first footnote is that we had effectively raised the argument that the temple is a denominational temple as well as a Vaishnavite temple under Article 26. And the relationship between the family and the temple is also protected by Article 25.1. So please recognize that and we placed volumes of literature. The court merely said, this is for the very first time that any party is raising an article 25 and 26 argument in the facts of this case. It was never raised before the high court. So I would actually thank the team that I was representing for having the common sense to invoke articles 25 and 26 in the context of a religious institution, <laughs> which nobody else did for all practical purposes before the high court. Okay. That would perhaps be the most obvious thing. That would be the most obvious thing. Now, the court has chosen not to entertain that particular argument. It has not rejected the argument. It says, I don't need to get into that issue because I'm arriving at the same conclusion through Article 8 anyways. Mm. So, I don't need to get into this academic issue at this particular point in time. Mm. That's what has happened. Right? right, right, right. For me, that's where it stands. So, does this judgment, like I said in the introduction, uh, would you agree with me that this judgment paves the way for, for the freedom of the temples all across the country? See, there are specific examples where this model can, can be considered. So, for instance, if you look at the manner in which the TTD is run, the Tirumala Tirupati Devasthanam, under Section 96 of the HRC Act of Andhra Pradesh of 1987, it is populated entirely by people appointed by the state. Okay? So, when you look at that structure and when you look at this structure, this is better. And you look at the structure which currently applies to the temples in Uttarakhand, where Dr. Swami is the only person to have actually challenged that particular Chardham Act, where the government there, the state government has taken over more than 51 temples, right? This structure is better than that structure. This structure is also better than the structure that currently applies to the Sri Jagannath Temple, because the Sri Jagannath Temple Administration Committee, under Section 5 of the Sri Jagannath Temple Act of 1955, again is a government-appointed board, it's a government-appointed committee. Compared to that kind of deep entrenchment of the state in those major temples, what are we really talking about here? But can this be applied to every other temple? I would be very circumspect and grounded in my extrapolation of that. To the extent that the court is willing to recognize a special relationship which is rooted in tradition and which is a religious relationship, it is a welcome sign that today Indian courts recognize a religious relationship which is Hindu in nature and character, hmm. okay? And which still also believes that the 
rights of control can reside in these royal families based on the facts and circumstances and the special relationship that the family enjoys with the temple, right? Any number of temples. So I'm saying from a big picture perspective, it is effectively a positive sign. It may not be a giant leap. It is perhaps a minuscule step. But for this temple, it's a giant leap compared to where it was in 2011, okay? And for similarly placed temples, this could perhaps at least start as the starting point of a discussion, if not the ideal end. Mm -hmm. So that brings up an interesting question, which is that for temples that are not that do not really have a ruler, a history of uh, the Raja or the right. princely kingdom behind them. Right. Uh, how do those temples, I mean, we often talk about freedom of temples from state control right. and stuff. Right. Right. The question that people often ask is how does when the government exits, what, what replaces it? Right. So right. do you have any thoughts on that? See, on that, the basic point is, if we subscribe to the concept of Sampradaya under Hindu tradition, it is possible to argue that over 70% of Hindu temples are Sampradayic temples. And therefore, they must enjoy the rights of autonomy available under Article 26. Which means members of the Sampradaya should fight for populating the administrative bodies of that particular temple, fight for the ouster of state, uh, let's say, uh, officials from that particular temple, and they must initiate proceedings on the ground. However, all of this can be, yes. That is what is called the denominational status. That is the de denominational status. The denominational status is a fairly powerful tool to prevent encroachment of the autonomy of the religious institution by the state. And therefore, the first goal is to prove that you are in the form of a denomination. For a moment, let's assume that you're not even a denomination. In principle, the argument can't be that it is state control, which is the default, and community control, which is the alternative. Because that is not what is said by Article 25 as well. So Article 25 2A only limits itself to the state's role to supervise. It's a supervisory role that the state performs. It is not an administrative role. You can't take over the entire process. Again here, Dr. Swami's judgment in Subramanya Swami versus State of Tamil Nadu, which is the Chidambaram judgment of January 2014, is a landmark judgment on this particular issue, where thanks to Dr. Swami's efforts and the efforts of Mr. T.R. Ramesh and others, this particular law was laid down by Justice B.S. Chauhan and Justice Bobade, who is now the current Chief Justice. So, the law as well as the remedy with respect to denominational temples and non-denominational temples is fairly clear. Unfortunately, the clarity has not percolated to public awareness. To a significant extent, I think a lot of us have to take the responsibility for not, uh, let's say, explaining this particular issue to the public in a language they understand, or maybe we have we've been too caught up in our own legalities to explain it to them. So I'm happy to take all the particular feedback, but the answer exists in law. So is the Chidambaram uh, management a sort of a template that could be used? See, the thing is the Chidambaram temple is also a denominational temple. Right. Okay. And nobody ever questioned their status as a denomination. Okay. So, the uh, let's say the position of communities which are in a position to establish their denominational status is slightly better. I am saying that even without the denominational temple, the state has a certain Lakshman Rekha which the constitution has drawn for itself. That is the Lakshman Rekha that you must insist on in principle. As long as you stick to that and you don't budge from that particular position, denomination or otherwise is a second issue. That comes much later. What I am is different. But where you are supposed to be is the first question, so stay out. So my next question is after this huge historic win, right? What, if, what next? Where do you see this entire movement going towards? Frankly, I don't know for a different reason because ever since the judgment was pronounced, in the last, it's been what, today is the 15th, on 13th it was pronounced. In a span of 48 hours, the reactions from certain quarters have been mercurial. Okay. And we are left wondering, are we reading it wrong as trained lawyers? Or are we really missing something? Or is somebody able to see something which our years of experience and training has told us, no, no, ignore this completely? Okay. Or assuming that there is a legitimate point of view. Like, uh, sorry for interrupting, but like how, you know, people see what the media persons don't see. You know, very <laughs> <laughs> see, I'm more than happy to uh, accept that this is not a 100% ideal outcome, as I said earlier. But there is a lot to draw heart from and hope from, okay? And if we want to convince ourselves that we are destined to be defeated always and that we are destined to lose always, I'm sorry, man can't put in what God has not. That's your problem, okay? 
but as someone who means business and who is clear about how this uh, thing could perhaps be achieved and what are the legal remedies available where we have so many people working with us, people who matter and people who take it very seriously who are committed to this are working with us. We know for a fact that there is a lot to build on from this particular judgment, at least with respect to similarly placed temples. In any case, it tells the community, please try and put some faith in this particular process. We are trying to take a shot at a certain edifice which has not worked for you all these decades. Now it has started showing results, so don't be disheartened. Okay? If you choose to be disheartened, you do it at your own peril and to your own detriment. Nobody else stands to lose anything. You do. We do as people, as community, we do. So I don't think uh, pessimism is a luxury that Hindus can afford. You have no other option but to be optimistic and perseverant. Keep attacking, keep getting the job done. So on that note, I think you've, you've answered most of all of our questions. So on that note, uh, until next time, thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Social distance. <laughs>